For those who are staying in here, uh, can I ask you to turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 32, which is found on page uh, 1,000. 100 and, sorry, 177, page 177 of uh, the church Bibles, or maybe 220 as well. We've got so many Bibles now because there's lots of people about. Uh, we've got two versions, and um, it's either 177 or 220, Deuteronomy 32. Um, maybe as you're, you're doing that, you're reflecting on, on what the choir were doing there, and, and maybe something you've been reflecting upon as uh, we've been here this morning. Uh, and it's the the goodness of being able to be together and to sing. There's something about being able to sing together that does your heart a lot of good. And there's something about the power of music that does our hearts good. And the Lord uses that to touch our hearts and our minds. And this morning, we're going to be looking at a song from God's Word. So let me lead us in a prayer and ask for God's help as we do that. So let's all pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you are a God who speaks to us. You speak to us in your word. And we pray, Father, that you by your Holy Spirit would speak very clearly to each of us now for Jesus' sake. Please would you help me, help all of us to listen. And we pray that your Spirit would apply the truth of your word to hearts which are open to you. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Well, as I said, there is something very compelling about the power of music, isn't there? Especially at this time of the year. Um, you only have to hear the opening lines of, Oh, Holy Night, or When a Child is Born, or Chestnuts Roasting on an Open Fire. And some of us, we just lose it. We just lose the plot. There are tears coming down. We're reminded of things in the past. And it's just this wonderful, cozy feeling. And actually, contrary to popular opinion, um, some recent studies suggest that listening sometimes to sad music, which sometimes is the case with Christmas, not just when Santa got stuck up the chimney, but all those kinds of music circumstances, um, those sad circumstances of, of life, they actually they're quite good for us um, because partly it, they provide a safe space in which to experience our emotions as we think about sad things. Sad songs can actually evoke a mixture of pleasure and pain and comfort. And sometimes when we feel unsettled, the truth of a song which identifies that sense of feeling unsettled does our hearts good. And today we come uh, to the end of our brief overview of the book of Deuteronomy. And over these last few weeks, we've been considering Moses' last words to his people. He has led them for 40 years out of slavery in Egypt, all the way through the Red Sea and then through the desert and the, the, the wilderness. They've been through some extraordinarily big moments and some very painful times as well. And Moses has just been recounting a lot of that as he's been recounting the law for the second time, which is what Deuteronomy means, the name means second law. And Moses knows he is about to die. We saw last week in what Paul was talking to us about from Deuteronomy 31, how he is passing on the torch, the baton um, of, of leadership to Joshua. And we're going to see, well, we won't see it today, but in the following chapters 33 and 34, it talks about his final blessing over God's people and, and then an account of, of what happened when he died. It's really moving because God takes him up to this mountain and he says, remember, you can't go into the promised land, but I'm going to show it to you. And he looks across and he sees it all. And you'd expect, therefore, in this moment in Deuteronomy chapter 32, as he um, brings his sermon to an end, that, that he's going to do something extraordinarily significant. And that's exactly what he does. He teaches Israel a new song to sing as they enter into the promised land. And we're thinking, that is great. That is awesome. This is the moment where you might expect the orchestra to belt it out full throttle. You'd expect the music to be going. This is the big finale. This is the big showstopper. But 
when you read the lyrics of the song, they may put things into a bit of an awkward gear. They're a little bit unsettling, maybe a bit uncomfortable, because there's a mixture of gladness and sadness, of pleasure, pain, and comfort. And that's why I've entitled the sermon today, Happily Ever After. Um, there's a typo which I missed. It's my fault. There should be a question mark after the title. So if you'd like to get a pen out and put a question mark after that, it should read, Happily Ever After. Because it's a question. And the reason I'm doing that is because there is a danger that we read the Bible like a Hallmark movie. Now, I'm not for a moment dissing on Hallmark movies. Well, not too much. But you know, you know the story I'm talking about. Um, there are uh, some bumps along the way in this story. But by the end, the unhappily single vet, doctor, florist, dance instructor, engineer... <laughs> Caterer, hotel manager, wedding planner, princess from some made-up European state. Whatever it is, they find their go-to partner and uh, they get the guy or they get the girl and it's all wonderful. And, and that's okay within a Hallmark movie. But, but there's a danger of thinking that the Bible is some sort of religious fairy tale. That... Living for Jesus now means that we live happily ever after, but that's not what's happening in Deuteronomy 32. And the Bible is about real people living in the real world. All of the mess that you and I have had to go through in this last week, God knows about that. He knows the struggles. He knows the motivation behind the struggles. He knows the reasons why the struggles are struggles in the first instance. And he sees the truth of them. And the question is, why does Moses teach this song here? Well, actually, you can see the immediate reason why he does it right at the end after he's sung the song and given it to them. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 46. Have a look at it with me. Um, this is kind of a summary, not just of the song, but the entire sermon series in many respects. But uh, Includes, of course, the song today. Take to heart, says Moses, all the words by which I am warning you today, that you can may command them to your children, that they may be careful to do all the words of this law, for it's no empty word for you, but your very life. And by this word, you shall live long in the land that you're going over the Jordan to possess. So there's a warning here in these verses, and there's also an extraordinary encouragement. These words are going to help you live the way God intends. So with all of that by way of introduction, let me read to you the beginning of the song and the end of the song. We haven't got time to go through it all verse by verse. I'm going to summarize it a little bit this morning. But let's look at verses 1 through to 14 of Deuteronomy 32, and then verses 36 to 43. So pin your ears back. Let's listen to the song. Here it is. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass, and like showers upon the herb. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity. Just and upright is he. They have dealt corruptly with him. They're no longer his children because they are blemished. They are a crooked and twisted generation. Do you thus repay the Lord, repay the Lord you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you, your elders and they will tell you. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. 
He found him in a desert land and in the howling waste of the wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him. He kept him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. The Lord alone guided him. No foreign God was with him. He made him ride on the high places of the land and he ate the produce of the field and he suckled him with honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock, curds from the herd and milk from the flock with fat of lambs, rams of bashan and goats with the very finest of the wheat and you drank foaming wine made from the blood of the grape. And then if we skip across, uh, in between times, it talks about people's rejection of the Lord, including the people who are about to enter into the land. Uh, And then we come to verse 34. Is not this laid up in store with me, sealed up in my treasuries? Vengeance is mine and recompense for the time when their foot shall slip, for the day of their calamity is at hand and their doom comes swiftly. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is gone and there is none remaining, bond or free. Then he will say, where are their gods, the rock on which they took refuge? who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offering. Let them rise up and help you. Let them be your protection. See now that I, even I, am he. There's no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and swear as I live forever. If I sharpen my flashing sword, my hand takes hold on judgment. I will take vengeance on my adversaries and will repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh. With the blood of the slain and the captives from the long haired heads of the enemy. Rejoice with him, O heavens. Bow down to him, O gods. For he avenges the blood of his children and takes vengeance on his adversaries. He repays those who hate him and cleanses his people's land. Folks, this song is so rich. Do go and look over it all properly through the course of this week. It's tying together themes which run through Deuteronomy. It was part of the regular worship in Jewish synagogues in the times past. And it's, it's picked up by several writers in the New Testament in places like Hebrews or 1 Corinthians or Philippians or Luke or Romans or Revelation. And some commentators describe what's going on here as a reeve, which basically means it's a covenant lawsuit. It's a case that God is making for the truth about who he is, his character. And you'll see from verses 1 through to 3 there of the song that the witnesses that Moses invokes, that he invokes on God's behalf, as it were, are the heavens and the earth. This is big stuff. You need to recognize, says Moses, who this Lord is. And folks, as you go into the promised land, he says, sing this song. Because it teaches us the truth about who God is. And it teaches us the truth about what we are really like. And that can be a bit unsettling, but it's what we need to sing. There are seven different movements in this uh, this song or this psalm. We're not going to look at them all in in, in extraordinary detail. Uh, We're going to look at three big summary movements, if you like. And they've got three headings. Sorry. Well, yeah, three headings. Rock, rejections, rule, and restoration. Rock, rejections, rule and restoration. Uh, You can think about those through the course of the week, but then first of all then, rock. We're looking at verses 1 through to 14 roughly here, because the Lord is described here as the rock. You see that in verse 4, and then again in verse 15, and then again in verse 18, and then again in 30, and in 31, and in 37. All the way through this song, we talk about the Lord as the rock, or other people trying to trust in other little rocks, small r. The question is, who you're really going to trust in? 
Because, you see, this picture of the Lord as the rock means that he is immovable. He is secure. He is a place of refuge and security. He's a place of strong defense. And we're told here in verses uh, 3, 4, and following that his work is perfect and all his ways, all his ways are justice. And there's a huge emphasis throughout this song upon God's just character. Now, that's important to remember, especially when we get into the rejections bit. Because God's treatment of people is not on a whim. He's not capricious. He's not mean. We're told here that he is faithful, a God of faithfulness, verse 4. And without iniquity, he's no reason to be guilty. If you want to put it this way, the Lord's got a clear conscience. He's just, he's upright. And this Lord is unswervingly good. Isn't God wonderful? This God has revealed himself to us. is amazing. He's all of the things that we hanker after and yearn after. And he's described, verse 15, as Israel's salvation. And then again, verse 18, he's the rock that bore them. He, he's responsible for this entire nation happening. And if you look again in these verses, verses 1 to 14 there, especially verse 6 and following, you'll see how God cares for his people. He is the Father, says Moses, who created you, who made you and established you. It's this wonderful picture of intimate care and love. The one who knows us better than we know ourselves. And then from verses 7 through to 14, we see how he also puts boundaries in place around the nations and, and showing again his sovereign rule. But also specifically verse 9 there, we're told that the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob, his allotted heritage. Again, it's as if God, Moses is saying, the Lord is saying here to us, We've got a special place in his heart. We are his portion. And you see how Moses reminds us there in verses 10 through to 14 of, of his care, especially in their experience. At verse 10, he found them in a desert land. That, that could be literally in the desert of the wilderness, but more likely it's talking about back in Egypt when they were in an absolute mess under slavery and under Pharaoh oppressed, facing injustice, and he encircled them. He cared for them. Look at the verbs of what all that God does for them. He helps them. He protects them. He bears them up. He alone guides them. Uh, the picture of the eagle with their wings, apparently what used to happen is or, uh, a, an eagle will, will shove their chick out of the nest to teach it to fly, but then will swoop down and catch it so that the chick lands on their wings. That's the picture here of God's care for his people. It's a wonderful, wonderful picture of God as a rock in whom we can always put our trust. And, and especially in verses 13 through 14, on this week of Thanksgiving and today, Thanksgiving Sunday, when we recognize that all of God's provision to us, did you hear the language there of all the really good stuff, the nice things to eat that these people are going to enjoy when they enter into the promised land? This is what the rock provided for God's people. And it's important for us, of course, to recognize God's provision to us. We'll say more about that again this evening. So this is our God. He is a rock. He is faithful. This is the reality of the God of the Bible. A just, dependable, faithful God who sees the truth of your life and of mine, who cares for the helpless, who rescues those who are oppressed from slavery. And this is the truth of our God, the rock. Sing about him. Is this the God you know? Are you trusting in him? Because you see, through all of this wonderful picture of who God is, there's a thread 
us the reality of what we are like. And Moses actually says it in verse 5. Uh, he talks about how God looks upon us and sees that we are a twisted and crooked generation, which leads to the second movement. He's talking in the first instance to the people who are crowded around in front of him at, at the place or on the pl plains of Moab. But the, the truth about human hearts is still the same. And so we get to the second heading. We've talked about the rock or rock. Secondly, rejections. And this is the middle section, which we didn't read today. But look particularly at verses 15 through to 18. Jeshurun here is a nickname for Israel, okay? But Jeshurun, verse 15, grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, stout, and sleek. Then he forsook God who made him and scoffed at the rock of his salvation. They stirred him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they had never known, to new gods they had come recently, whom, that had come recently whom your fathers had never dreaded. You were unmindful of the rock that bore you, and you forgot the God who gave you birth. You see, the problem with Israel is that its complacency leads to uh, rejection of God. They prosper in the land, but they forget the one for whom the prosperity is derived. Even though they've been given everything by God, they forsake their maker. They scoff at what he's done for them. They chase after pretend gods, which, verse 17, are actually demons. They're unmindful. They don't care about the God who cares for them. They forget about the one who brought them into existence. It's a biting picture, isn't it, of the fickleness of the human heart. Here they are growing fat and stout and sleek. You can get the picture, can't you? It's just got lazy boy written all over it. They're enjoying all the benefits of God's provision. Yet, sorry, there's nothing against lazy boys. We've got one in our house and I love it. The danger, however, is that we stay there and think that that lazy boy is mine by right. Ultimately rejecting the God who gave it to them in the first place. And as a result of their complacent idolatry, because of their rejection of God, because they scoff at him, because they kind of push him to the sides of their lives and shove him to the margins as if he doesn't matter if he even existed in the first place, what's the result of their rejection? Look at verse 19 with me. The Lord saw it and spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face for them. I will see that their end will be, for they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faithfulness. It's an awful picture. And there's a play on words in verse 21. They've made me jealous with what is no God. They've provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are no people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. God is going to give them over to a no people. And we see that happens in the story of God's people over the centuries, how in centuries to come, they reject the Lord, and so they are exiled out of the promised land. 722, the northern tribes of Israel are taken off to Assyria. 587, the tribes of Benjamin and Judah are taken off into exile in Babylon. The place is a mess. And here we see that this song is being sung by God's people hundreds of years before it happens. And the truth that the song contains is that they'd be wiped out completely, but for the fact that their potential captors were, will wrongly assume that they'd captured God's people instead of the Lord allowing it to happen. Verse 25. And you see, it's unclear as well with all of that, that God, well, God is sovereignly at work. That's very clear, but it's unclear, verses 26 to 33, uh, they refer, referring to the, the false hearts, whether that's the false hearts of Israel or the, the prospective captures false hearts. Either way, Moses is singing this song about God's people as they enter into the promised land, see the reality of who God is and see the reality of who you are. 
unless your hearts are right with the Lord, you will be overturned. And your rejection of God will lead to his rejection of you. It's a pattern we actually see repeated in the New Testament, Romans chapter 1. Because people suppress the truth about who God is, God gives them over to the things that they're chasing after. Even though God has made it really clear about who he is in creation and in the fact that we've all got a conscience, the fact that we can distinguish between right and wrong, we push God to the sides. And that deserves God's just anger, his wrath, is how Paul puts it. God gives people over to false gods, living and serving created things rather than our creator. And without Jesus in our lives, we live in spiritual exile, which leads us to the final summary moment, movement of the song. We, we've talked about rock, we've talked about rejections, and now thirdly, rule and restoration. There's judgment on Israel, yet there is hope through the judgment. At some point in the future, when they've reached their end of themselves, when they've tied a knot on the end of the rope and they're just holding on because they've got nowhere else to turn, at that point, then, verse 36, the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is gone and there is none remaining, bond or free. You see, the point there is that the Lord will again establish the truth of his name. Verse 38, I am, even I am he, and there is no God beside me. Do you remember we talked about that earlier on in Deuteronomy? When you want to know the truth about God, you need to know the Lord. Without knowing him, you don't know God because there only is one God, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh. Know him, you know God. Without knowing him, you do not know God. And verse 41, God promises justice on his adversaries. He promises death on those who oppose him. People who oppose him will be overthrown. But verse 43, in the final doxology, in that very last line, we read that he's also a God who cleanses. Here he talks about cleansing the land. Good news about Christianity is that God also cleanses the soul. If you're a Christian here this morning, Moses' song is actually a very accurate representation of what the Lord has done in your life and my life. We were spiritual exiles. We were facing his just anger and his judgment. But in his kindness, under his sovereign rule, he has brought us into a place of restoration where we face God's grace. Forgiveness, healing, love. We deserve his just rejection, but in his compassion, the just judge also becomes the one who is justly judged. And that happens at the cross of Jesus Christ. He sacrifices himself at the cross. God gives to us his son. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for our sake so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Talk about restoration. That's the truth of Christianity. And the encouragement from this passage is to understand that this is the truth about each of us. So folks, we need to entrust ourselves this week, this Thanksgiving 2022, to this rock. But you might think, well, what does that look like? Well, We've just had a wonderful demonstration of it about 20 minutes ago. All those people, different walks, different ages, different stages in life, different stories. One Lord, one Savior, one rock. What about you? What does it mean for you to put your trust in this rock? Let me just draw out three applications as we close. First of all, if you are not a follower of Jesus here today, can I say two things? First of all, you are really welcome. So glad you're here. 
and we want you to be here. You need to hear these words. They're not comfortable. You might not like what you're hearing, but just because we don't like it doesn't make it any less true. And we need to hear these things. God loves you, and he loves you enough to let you go your own way, but he does it so that you will turn back to him. Now, you might not like hearing that, but as I say, we need to. And, and, and this is the warning from these words. Uh, this is the warning that this is what your life is like apart from God. And maybe you've come to that realization. Maybe you're realizing this. You, you've reached rock bottom. You feel as if you're in some sort of spiritual exile when it comes to God. You look at all of these Christians, you're thinking, they've got something I don't. Well, it's because God and his kindness has intervened in our lives. And he offers you that intervention too today. And my encouragement to you is to take it. Look at the character of God here. He's the one who cares, knows you, loves you, has done everything for you. Don't reject him. And for all of us, and this is the second big application, as we look to this rock, I think we need to appreciate that God is very great. This song is a shape of things to come in Deuteronomy 32. Uh, Paul picks up on the shape of this in the New Testament. Not Paul who preached last week, but the Apostle Paul. And because the, the Paul, the Apostle, he recognizes that the amazing mystery of God's purpose is that the very judgment of Israel for their unbelief will lead to the, to the salvation of of the nations, which in turn will lead to the repentance and restoration of Israel. That sounds like a big mouthful, but think about it this way. There's a pattern here. You read about it in Romans chapters 9 through to 11. God chooses the people of Israel. The people of Israel reject God by and large. As a result of their rejection, the Gentiles look at their rejection and go, we want to believe in this Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, the Jews who are initially rejected look at the Gentiles who now believe and go, we want to believe in Jesus Christ too. And so they are vindicated. Do you hear the language? Judgment, rejection, involvement of the Gentiles, vindication. Straight out of Deuteronomy chapter 32. We could never make that up. We could never do that. And, and here in Deuteronomy 32, there's a, there's a doxology at the end. as the heavens and the earth are called to declare God's amazingness. At the end of Romans chapter 11, Paul calls God's people and says... Praise God. Declare his glory. See the truth of who he is. As we see people restored and together, worship him. You cannot outthink this God. You cannot outmaneuver this God. He's so much greater and bigger. Will you trust in this rock? And that brings us to the third application. Someone once said that a sound wisdom consists both of knowing God and knowing ourselves. And this song reminds us about God's faithfulness and our fickleness. There's a warning here against sacrificing our lives to false gods, chasing after idols, which might look wonderful. They might not be something we bow down to in the corner of our room, but maybe they might be something that we bow down to in the corner of of our hand, and we can't get away from it through the course of a day. And so we are stuck with the idol of this age, which is approval. What others think of me, what I think about other people, how many ticks I've got against my name, how many thumbs up I have, what other people say or believe about me. And we need to pray that the Lord would undo the shame culture habits of this age and that we'd repent of the foolishness of acquiescing to its small-minded, bigoted demands. We can quite literally, in our society today, write lives off in 144 characters or less. It's nonsense. Turn to the rock. Turn to the rock because he is justice. 
And when we trust in Jesus before this God, we are 100% approved. God gives us all the ticks. And there is at very least a warning here for us who have benefited so much as well from the generosity of God and the kindness of God in so many ways not to become complacent, to chase after false gods. Folks, we are only here because of his grace. We will only ever be here because of his grace. Brian said it so well earlier on. And particularly on a Sunday where we've recognized over 30 people coming into our church family, knowing that there are more in the months ahead. Praise God for that. Pray we don't get complacent or, or pat ourselves on the back as if it's something that we've done. Don't believe the lie that it's something great about us or how good we are. Not a bit of it. God has been kind. God has been good. We are so glad you are here. And we're here because of our rock. We are here because of him. Give glory to him. And, and as you step into your Thanksgiving week this week, sing this song. Sing about the rock. Think about our rejection of him. And thank him. Thank him for his rule. Thank him for his restoration in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you are our rock. Your ways are perfect. All your ways are just. You are faithful. You are good. You are upright. Lord, as we consider the truth of your character, we recognize the truth of our own. We are faithless, careless, we tell lies. We, we run away from you. Thank you, God, that you tell us the truth about ourselves so that we could truly know you and be forgiven. Please, would you help each of us to turn to you, our rock, and stand on you today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.